Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. I have this feeling that I have no sound. I have no sound. Shall, shall I shout or is there a sound person coming on? Hello? Hello? Ah, there's sound. Hello. Good afternoon. Just a few technical difficulties. Think of it as static. In any case, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to City Club's Friday Forum. Do I have sound? Okay. On uh, community building and community bridging with our guest speaker, Dr. Manuel Pastor, Jr. It's co-sponsored by a coalition for a livable future, which is an alliance of 60 community organizations whose mission it is to ensure a sustainable and socially just future for citizens in the Portland and Vancouver metro area. 60 coalition, 60 community organizations in this coalition, which is quite remarkable, I think. Uh, it's in conjunction with their second annual regional livability summit that they have invited Dr. Pastor to come and speak. Their opening reception is tonight at Wyden and Kennedy, and their summit will be held tomorrow at Benson High School. There's more information about it in the lobby. But before our program begins, let's talk about what's coming up in the future for the City Club. Our pri program next Friday, April 9th, is a departure from our usual debate forum because uh, we'll be having current Commissioner Randy Leonard, who will be appearing versus the Neighborhood Activist Six, and it will be moderated by Mark Sussman, who's the editor of Willamette Week. Uh, rumor has it that Mark is going to be wearing a black and white striped shirt. So <laughs> we shall see. On the following Friday, on April 16th, we will have the four leading candidates for mayor in a more uh, traditional forum. And then, as you may have noticed from some of the activities that we've been engaging in, this is not your father's city club. On the 19th, the new, leaders city count, the new Leaders Council has teamed up with the Bus Project and Willamette Week for a forum, or I, it's called an event, called Candidates Gone Wild. It's going to be a very unusual and uncensored political debate to be held at the Aladdin Theater. The organizers are promising live music, libations, and lots of candidates. Lots because nobody really knows how many there are going to be until the last minute. Uh, it's two dollars if I think that fare is probably pretty manageable for everyone and you can buy tickets in the lobby as well as buying them from Willamette Week. Uh, also I'd like to mention that our membership drive is in full swing and every week new members can put their name into a drawing for a raffle and the raffle prize this week is a drawing for two annual passes for the Portland streetcar. So there are membership um, applications on the table, or you can speak with a staff person about it. So please, if you're not a member, we would very, really very much like to have you join us. Also, if you are already a member and you are still thinking about bringing in some new members, you will have the opportunity to be put into a pool of in fact, the person who recruits the most new members will get to have lunch with a City Club celebrity member who is, as we speak, in a city with uh, cherries in bloom. The sound of one hand clapping. because it's That will be our mystery guest. Um, also, City Club wants to invite you to a free ride on TriMet's new Interstate, Interstate Max. It runs north. Uh, it is not going to open. It's going to be the yellow line, and it won't open until next month. But since City Club has connections, and we will have a special preview for you, it's going to occur on Thursday, April 15th. So you can deliver your taxes to the post office and then come on over to the new Interstate Max and see how your tax dollars are being spent. We will have a narrator who will talk about this particular light rail development as well as the public art, environmental, <coughs> environmental issues, and the transportation infrastructure. And no, the narrator is not Ray Polani. Uh, information on all programs and events can be found in the bulletin or on the website or speak with one of the staff. And broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible by corporate underwriting from Kaiser Permanente, Pope and Talbot, and Shorebank Pacific. We're extremely grateful for their support. Now to today's program. Our very distinguished guest, Dr. Manuel Pastor, is a professor of Latin and Latino studies 
and the director of the Center for Justice, Tolerance, and Community at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He received his MA and PhD in economics from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. His professional honors include Fulbright Fellowships, that's plural, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. He's a prolific writer with several books to his credit. He's written many articles for professional journals. In fact, I was just telling him his CV just went for page after page after page when I was printing it. And he's written for uh, popular publications such as the LA Times and the Christian Science Monitor. He's a frequent speaker on issues of community empowerment. So, Dr. Manuel Pastor, welcome. Thank you. I wanted to uh, encourage all of you to go to that uh, session, Candidates Gone Wild. When is that? On April 19th. On April 19th. We actually just had a few months of Candidates Gone Wild in California. <laughs> And we were able to get a new governor out of the deal. Uh, we'll see what happens here. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I haven't been in uh, Portland for about four or five years and uh, just remembered how beautiful it was and what a good time I had last time I was here. I'm also really delighted to be here because <coughs> this uh, morning on my way here, I went to uh, take a very early flight and I arrived and I asked for a different seat so that I could perhaps be a bit more comfortable with an aisle seat. And the airline kindly did give me a nicer seat, but on a different plane. Um, so uh, I was on the plane this morning, and when they announced that it was going to Seattle, um, I said, geez, will it be stopping in Portland along the way? Uh, it wasn't. Uh, I disembarked. I found another aircraft. And uh, here I am rather at the last minute. Um, so I'm actually quite excited. I was trying to figure out why this had happened, though, uh, why it was that I'd been uh, arrived, and instead of being steered to go to uh, Portland, I was steered to go to Seattle. And my only hypothesis is that the uh, airline ticket agents were trying to protect you from yet another Californian <laughs> moving up here, <coughs> and instead were steering me to uh, Seattle. And uh, so you have me instead, but I just want to assure you that I'm not moving. I won't be staying here after this talk, and uh, so no need to uh, keep me from coming again. I've been asked to give three talks, actually, while I'm uh, here. This talk at the City Club, uh, a reception uh, tonight, and then a talk at the conference tomorrow. Um, so it's, it's going to be tough trying to keep track of what I say in each audience. I will ask you that if I say a joke, I give you a joke today, and it's incredibly funny, that you laugh tomorrow if I use the same joke. Uh, those of you listening to it on the radio, too. Uh, I'm going to try to make three points uh, in this talk today, uh, partly because no one really ever remembers more than three points. And the three points uh, can actually be thought of as being three Cs, uh, one about collaboration, uh, one about conflict, and one about capacity. Let me talk about the first. Let me outline this, and then I'll go through and talk about these. There's sort of a new movement that is really sweeping the country, or seeping up in certain ways in many different places in the country that is seeking to revitalize civic life and civic engagement. And it is a movement around thinking about cities and suburbs in a regional context, thinking about ourselves as regions, and lifting up the question of regional equity, of fairness and inclusion in the prospects and projects of trying to craft a uh, region. Now, this new regionalism, which focuses a lot on collaboration, really does offer a route to a new America. I want to indicate to you that it's a lot more than a promise about smarter growth or fairer growth. It really offers a route to a new way of thinking about ourselves as a society because there's a way that this new regionalism has appeals to business and the economy. It has appeals to environmentalists and those worrying about sustainability. It has appeals to those who've traditionally worked on social justice issues. And it provides a way to try to bring those concerns together. It provides a way to make a bridge between cities and suburbs, between different kinds of communities. Um, it suggests collaboration. 
And so there's a hopeful movement sweeping the country about regional equity, and I'm going to try to sketch that out. The second point I'm going to try to make is that while this movement has focused a lot on collaboration and points of common ground and common interest, it's also the case that conflict is going to be an important part of defining a regional equity agenda. Let me explain just a second why and uh, then make the last point and then go ahead and give the talk. Um, you know, I wrote a book last year with a few colleagues, Angela Glover Blackwell from PolicyLink and Stuart Quo from the Asian Pacific American Legal Center. It's called In Search of the Uncommon Common Ground, New Dimensions on Race in America. And I want to highlight that title, In Search of the Uncommon Common Ground. I should say to all of you, by the way, that the book is available, I'm sure at PALS, um, as well as on Amazon.com. Uh, and it will soon be made into a major motion picture uh, as well. <coughs> I'm actually just back from Los Angeles where I was negotiating the movie rights uh, for that, and uh, we did strike a deal. Um, there was some debate about whether uh, the person that would portray me would be uh, Antonio Banderas. I thought that was nice, or Ricky Martin. Um, and uh, since I'm in the middle of a little midlife crisis. I was rooting for Ricky, you know, because he's a bit younger. But Antonio got it, and you'll be seeing that next year as it rolls out. In Search of the Uncommon Common Ground. Why that title? Because we are really quite convinced that when people talk about race, when they talk about a regionalism, a lot of things in the United States, we, we think about the common ground, but we often think about it as the lowest common denominator. We think about it as the lowest common denominator in ways that people try to divide one another by appealing to base instincts. But even those who are trying to bring people together try to agree on the least consequential thing possible, right? We all like one another. We're all friendly. We agree on the lowest common denominator instead of challenging ourselves to the highest common ground, the uncommon common ground. And this new regional movement, if it's to have hope, will be challenging us to uncommon common ground, and it will be full of conflict as well as collaboration. So that's the second point. And then the third point that I'll be making today <coughs> is that to really make this work requires capacity building. And it requires capacity building in particular on the part of the low income communities and often communities of color that have been out of the debates around regionalism, that have been out of the debates around what our society is going to look like economically and socially. We, if we want to move ahead, are going to have to uh, incorporate these groups and incorporating these groups means building capacity for people to participate. Uh, we need to understand that we're really only as strong as the team. We're really only as strong as the neighborhoods and communities and people that have been left behind in the past. And unless we make the investments to bring everyone on board, we won't move ahead. So collaboration, uh, conflict, and capacity, that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, for those of you uh, who now want to tune out for the next 20 or so minutes, uh, I will talk and then I will come back at the end and I'll say those three points again and you can uh, come back awake and uh, act quite engaged. Now, <coughs> what is this notion of this new movement sweeping the country around regionalism and uh, regional equity? Well, Portland in some sense has been part of it for a while because you've thought about yourself as a metropolitan region and you've also had metropolitan mechanisms. Um, but this is a lot broader than the kinds of mechanisms that have been here, and it's a kind of new regionalism which is really arguing that there are re economic, environmental, and social reasons why we should be thinking about our futures in regional contexts. Uh, the first of these is the economic rationale. If you look at the performance of economies in the United States, what used to seem like a relatively homogenous economy, in the sense that if the national economy blossomed, almost all regions did well. If the national economy slumped, almost all regions did poorly, has really become a kind of common market of regions. That is, the performance of regions have beco has become much more heterogeneous. Some regions doing much better than others, What where before we used to see all regions sort of growing at uh, similar rates, we're seeing a lot of disparities between different regions. The economy has in fact become quite regionalized, and it's become regionalized around the kinds of business and industrial clusters that come together in regions, and for that reason, 
business groups have been particularly interested in organizing themselves regionally to make sure that their economies roll forward. One of the prime examples of this, of course, is in the Silicon Valley. Not doing so well right now, uh, but uh, was doing quite well, and it certainly saw itself as a regional economy, and in fact, one of the premier business organizations, Joint Venture Silicon Valley Network, organize the businesses to think together and organize the businesses to push for public policies that would serve their interests at a regional level. So this has been a very important thing that business is beginning to think regionally and thinking of itself as being clusters. Joint Venture Silicon Valley Network formed in the early 1990s can take part of the credit for the recovery of that economy in the middle of the 1990s by organizing those businesses to collaborate as well as to compete. One of the prime achievements they wound up uh, getting during that period of time was agreeing, uh, getting 23 municipalities to agree to the same building code. Uh, how many of you think that's a miracle? <coughs> well, the reason that they did it was it was so hard for them when they were making, they knew they wanted to have the investments cluster in the Silicon Valley, but if you're sitting there negotiating with 23 different municipalities, you don't know how you can build and how you can build rapidly and go to scale. And so one of the major achievements they did was to try to create a uniform playing field with regard to these building codes. So that's the way that they've thought about things regionally, and you've seen a lot of businesses do that kind of work. We're also seeing a lot of environmentalists who for a long time have recognized that environmental issues are regional, uh, certainly have had a fascination in places like here with growth boundaries, and have recognized that the kind of sprawl typical of regions is something that's eating up open space and something which can only be stopped through the kinds of regional planning mechanisms that can limit outward growth, protect farmland, protect open space, and try to steer things back in to the inner city. So business has been interested in regionalism for a while and what might be thought of as the new regionalism. Environmentalists have become increasingly interested in it. Design people have as well. The folks who are talking about new urbanism and the creation of new downtowns have been interested in regionalism. And increasingly, those who are concerned with social justice issues are interested in regions as well. Um, I came to regionalism myself when I was living in Los Angeles. I was living in Los Angeles between 1984 and about 1996. I also grew up in LA. And in 1992, we had, as you may recall, the largest civil unrest in US history terms of property damage and other things. And right after that civil unrest, many of us were sitting around trying to think about what had caused it and what we could do. And you know how when a big event like that happens, you sort of run from meeting to meeting, thinking that if you went to just one more meeting, you'd actually solve the problem? Ever done that? And in the middle of one of those meetings, with all of us in this kind of frantic mood about what to do about community development in low-income communities, someone leaned back and said, you know, there's an immediate need to think long-term. And it hit us. And what we realized is that while we were focusing in on our neighborhoods, business was talking about regions, environmentalists were talking about regions. While we were focusing in on the neighborhoods, the things that were impacting those neighborhoods were the effects of sprawl and disinvestment that were connected to regional growth patterns. That while we were focusing in on the neighborhoods, jobs were being created in other locations. And that people who lived in wealthy areas didn't seem to work right in their neighborhood. So it didn't seem sensible why we had to put jobs in low-income neighborhoods. How did we connect people instead to that employment? And we began to think about how we could operate regionally as well. So a lot of people interested in social justice issues have begun to think regionally in terms of recognizing that sprawl has left many communities behind, in terms of recognizing the issues of job connection that I just mentioned, and also in terms of recognizing the pressures of gentrification. I, uh, live right now in Santa Cruz, California, which is right near the Silicon Valley. We work with groups in San Jose and Oakland and East Palo Alto and the rest of the Bay Area. You know, in East Palo Alto right now, which is an area which is largely African American and Latino and one of the poorest areas in the Bay Area, the median housing price is now about $500,000. This is not because East Palo Alto has suddenly become more attractive. It's because there are pressures from the regional housing market on that area and people wanting to move in to have jobs closer to employment. 
we began to recognize that no matter what you do around housing, unless you're thinking about it regionally, you're going to get pressures of gentrification. And a lot of people have begun thinking about transportation and transportation justice as well. And certainly issues of environmental justice. Certainly issues about where the toxic wastes and environmental disamenities and environmental amenities like parks are located in the region uh, and how we need to think about those things regionally and how we think need to think about the kinds of decisions that are made about where we put our trash, uh, where we put toxic waste, et cetera, and the fact that so much of that is disproportionately in uh, low-income uh, minority communities. Um, I've done a lot of work on that, by the way, and when I first started doing work on that, I got a very big grant uh, to do work on environmental justice, and I went and I told my, my aunt, uh, my tia, tia Dalia, I said, tia Dalia, tia Dalia, I just got this big grant to work on issues of environmental justice. And she said, oh, Manuelito, that's wonderful. I'm so proud of you. What is environmental justice? I said, oh, tia, that's the fact that hazards are disproportionately in uh, minority and poor neighborhoods. And she smiled at me still with pride, and then she looked at me with great sadness and said, Manuelito, everyone knows that. <laughs> so everyone knows that, but I spent my life researching it. Uh, <laughs> sh shows you a little bit about my academic work. But one of the things I think is that I'm going to try to talk to you as we move through this about some stuff like that, which is actually pretty common sense, which we don't wind up using in the way that we organize our society or think about things. I mean, if you think about the way you organize your family or your church or your neighborhood, you realize that if you treat people fairly, if you give everybody an opportunity, if you're inclusive, your family works better. I don't know how many of you in the morning, like your kid comes in for breakfast and you go, nah, you weren't good yesterday, I'm not feeding you. <laughs> you just don't do that, right? You're building a community with those kids. Now, some of you may have done that this morning, actually, but uh, we'll talk about that later. So. As we've seen this new regionalism emerge, this new regionalism which has a business element to it, an environmental element, and this increasing interest on the part of social justice groups, there's also been a realization that equity is crucial, inclusion is crucial, and not just to the social justice advocates. Um, for business groups, uh, we did uh, a book prior to the book that I just told you about. This other book was called Regions That Work, How Cities and Suburbs Can Grow Together. Um, that was also made into a major motion picture. Uh, but regions that uh, work tried to look at the relationship between cities and suburbs. And we did a statistical study of 75 different metropolitan areas in the United States. And we found out that those areas that were more equitable, in fact, had faster per capita income growth. Those areas that had, that were trying to reduce poverty, that had less disparities between cities and suburbs that were trying to have a more even distribution of income between the top of the income distribution and the bottom, in fact, had higher per capita income growth. Why? Well, and by the way, for those of you who uh, took uh, statistics in graduate school, that's even controlling for the fact that growth affects poverty and equity in a two-stage simultaneous least squares regression. <laughs> so. Why is it that we had that finding? Well, what we've begun to think about is the fact that when you have an inequitable society, you are underinvesting in human capital. You are underinvesting in the capacity to produce. When you have problems of poverty and separation between the central city and the suburb, you have issues around social capital. You have issues around the ways that people come together and can agree or not agree on what a growth strategy is for a region. And you have issues as well around housing in regions that are inequitable. In regions that have higher levels of inequity, you tend to have a situation where certain kinds of housing are going in one place, certain kinds of housing in another, and you generally get a kind of underbuilding of housing and underbuilding of affordability, and you have a lot of problems. So there's a lot of reasons why we begin to think that equity, which also has an impact on the quality of life, may have an impact on economic growth. And interestingly, over the last couple of years, this main business organization I was telling you about, Joint Venture Silicon Valley Network, has lifted up as one of its goals equity. Because they realize that it's actually essential to the economic health of a region to have school systems that are working and producing the young workers that they need, to have the kind of social consensus between groups that allows them to have uh, the same building code in 22 different municipalities so they can roll forward, that allows them 
to have the kinds of interventions in the economy that will help low-income people and also help business. And you're seeing increasingly businesses get interested in this. Uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, the Bay Area Council has launched something called the Community Capital Investment Initiative, which is trying to invest in low-income neighborhoods and try to make sure that they're part of the regional economy as well. In Chicago, Metropolit uh, Metropolitist, uh, Metro 2020, uh, or Metro Metropolis 2020, uh, which is ma really a business organization headed by someone named George Rainey, um, has gotten a number of businesses to agree that their investments will go into areas that have a commitment to affordable housing and have a commitment to public transportation. That is the kinds of neighborhoods that are tend to be more low income and communities of uh, color. And you're beginning to see, I think, this realization that this really does make a difference. We'll talk more about that. You're beginning to see environmentalists, I think, as well, recognize that equity has to be an important part of their agenda with regard to the protection of open space and the reduction of sprawl. And the reason for that is really quite clear. If you think about sprawl and the reasons why sprawl occurs, one of the main reasons why sprawl occurs is because people are trying to separate from one another and fragment further a metropolitan landscape so that they have their own municipalities in which they can control their own school districts or in which they can have the kinds of uh, separation from one another typical of sprawl and suburbia. And that kind of desire for fragmentation and separation is in our society largely driven by race and class. So there's a reason to pay attention to questions of equity even from the issues of environmentalism. For environmentalists, too, the idea of pushing development back inward, often toward the central city, is a place of alliances between those concerned about community development and those concerned about uh, environmental protection. We're also seeing uh, in uh, California is an interesting thing that's been emerging recently, which is that the environmental movement is increasingly reaching out to the Latino community in particular, both because it's a growing community in terms of its numbers, but also because polling data is suggesting that Latinos vote more environmentally than white voters in the state of California. They actually tend to vote more for protecting open space, tend to treasure more the forests and the oceans, and in part of it is that they are so close to the environmental disamenities that in terms of environmental injustice that they recognize uh, what it means to protect the environment, so allies. And we've just finished a very interesting study which also shows that, and this is pretty, I, anyway, I think it's interesting. We did it, so I must think it's interesting. Uh, that areas in California and uh, increasingly throughout the country, areas that are more segregated tend to have higher levels of pollution. Now, why is that? Scratch your head. Well, it actually makes sense. If you have a lot of segregation and a lot of uneven distribution, that means people are tending to think about putting hazards in somebody else's backyard. But if you think you're going to put hazards in somebody else's backyard, you wind up getting more hazards in everyone's yard. So there's a lot of interest by environmentalists in this question of equity as well. So there's a lot of intersection, I think, between these three sort of thrusts. But there's, they're often also speaking past one another. Quite often, business is speaking the language of competitiveness and the economy and very little else. Very often, environmentalists are speaking a language of sustainability, but not speaking and reaching out around the issues of equity and inclusion. And community groups are often speaking around issues of inclusion and equity, but paying very little attention to the need to make sure that the economy is humming forward and incorporating that element into our thinking as well. So it seems to me like there's a possibility for these three strands of this new regionalism, the business strand, the environmental strand, and the social justice strand to come together. There's an exciting sense in which they are coming together, but it's complicated. And there are problems ahead, and I want to talk about those. But I want to say before I talk about those problems, why do we see such an interest, I think, in people wanting to see whether or not these three strands can be put together. I think there are practical reasons, as I mentioned. I think that business groups increasingly recognize that underinvesting in human capital is not healthy for a regional economy. I think that environmental groups look and see where the allies are for votes 
and they look and see these patterns of urban sprawl and recognize that tackling issues of equity and inclusion will actually help protect the environment. And I think social justice folks who in this current uh, cl political climate don't necessarily feel at the top of their game are certainly feeling like reaching out to other groups that may have parallel agendas makes great sense. So there's an issue of kind of common interests and problem solving that drives people together. But I think there's something a little bit deeper that is driving people together around these issues as well. And that is, as you begin to see these conversations emerge in different regions, people are beginning to realize the power of face-to-face, race-to-race, and space-to-space -space conversations. That is, if we begin to think about how our futures are tied together in a region, it becomes a lot harder to have the kind of negative environmental and equity patterns that we've seen. And there is a great deal of interest in how it is that we can do community building and community bridging through the use of this new regional framework. Let me give you just a quick example about how an equity-oriented group has done exactly that. In northwest Indiana, not usually a place we look to for innovative ideas, the uh, Interfaith Federation, w which was working mostly in Gary, Indiana, and low-income neighborhoods, spent had an had a, uh, activity called Operation Holy Ground, where what they were trying to do was to remove crack houses from the neighborhood. And they worked very hard on this, and they got crack houses out of their neighborhood. And what they realized was that once they had the crack houses out of their neighborhood, they still didn't have any jobs in the neighborhood. And they began to say, how is it that they could get jobs? And what they realized was that you might be able to get jobs into the neighborhood, but another thing that you could do is connect the people in the neighborhood to jobs that were around the region and that a lot of the jobs in the region were actually being generated in the suburbs. But people couldn't get there because the transportation wasn't available for them to get there. So they went and started investigating their metropolitan planning organization. And they realized that there, in their area there were three central cities and they all had their own sort of metropolitan planning uh, area. And in general, the transportation system was set up to make it difficult for people in the central cities to go back out to the suburbs to find employment. And normally what a group would have done is to lay cl claims of racism and protest, et cetera. What they decided to do was they realized that if they couldn't get out to the suburbs, people who were in the suburbs couldn't get into the central city. So a largely African-American congregation went out and started meeting with white congregations to say, you know, isn't it terrible they don't have mechanisms for you to get into the central city via public transit? And they worked together to get the three separate metropolitan planning associations to come together and become one transportation agency to create an interconnected transportation system which has given people in the central city the opportunity to get out to jobs that are in the suburbs. This is a different way of doing community development work. And note the way that it happened politically was through face-to-face, space-to-space, race-to-race -race conversations. And I think the excitement around this regional equity agenda is not simply that it's a way to solve problems, but that it's a way to begin a conversation in a highly fragmented and segmented and divided society. A society which finds itself separated and a society which is longing to come together. Now, that's all kind of happy face though. That's all about how it can come together and work well. You know, when I think sometimes about the mantra that we give about collaboration, I'm reminded of uh, that ride in Disneyland. I'm sure some of you, even up in Portland, have been down to Disneyland, right? You remember that ride in Disneyland called It's a Small World? And there's all those children singing, right? And they're all very happy, right? Which is really great, but of course, as you know by listening to the world news, it's not all that happy out there, right? There's a lot of conflict. And I think sometimes when we talk about these strands of regionalism coming together and their common points of interest, all we focus in on is the collaboration, and we don't always think about the fact that there's also an important role for conflict. If we come back to families, you know, how many of you have some conflict in your family? Maybe, oh, the really, the really brave people raise their hands, right? Uh, and uh, we're going to do a little family therapy now about it. Uh, 
No, I mean, we know that conflict is part of our growth as well. And there's a sense sometimes when we talk about this regional agenda and people coming together that we forget about how conflict can actually be part of doing something good. Let me give you an example. Out of Los Angeles, there's a group in South LA formed in the wake of the LA civil unrest called Agenda. And uh, in the middle of the 19, and they did a lot of kind of grassroots development work uh, beginning to bring people together in conversation in South LA. And in the middle of the 1990s, the city of Los Angeles proposed giving a $70 million subsidy to DreamWorks. You know that studio? And the three people who own DreamWorks are uh, Steven Spielberg and Jeffrey Katzenberg and, uh, the, uh, and David Geffen. Um, Steven Spielberg is not low income. And a $70 million subsidy seemed like kind of an affront. And what was interesting was that the usual community response would be to either say, we got to yank that subsidy, that's unfair. Or to say, geez, DreamWorks, they shouldn't get a subsidy to locate in West LA, which is where they wanted to locate. They should be forced to locate in South LA and bring the jobs to us. That's the usual community response. What did Agenda do? Agenda had been spending years thinking about regional equity. So what Agenda said is, fine if they get a $70 million subsidy, but we have to come up with a job training program. And we have to come up with a job training program which takes kids from our neighborhoods, teaches them animation skills, brings them to the community colleges, and places them in a regionally rooted industry, the film industry. They jammed DreamWorks up. They fought with DreamWorks. It was a hard, hard struggle. And at the end of that hard, hard struggle with DreamWorks in the city, DreamWorks agreed to a $5 million program of job training to train people through the community colleges for the animation industry. That's a neat end of that story, but it's not even the end of the story. Because what happened was the city of LA then, oh, DreamWorks decided not to put the studio in West LA. Decided not to build the studio. The subsidy on the part of the city of LA was taken away. But DreamWorks kept its commitment. And in fact, helped Agenda form something called Workplace Hollywood, which is bringing together all of the studios to think about this issue of bringing people from inner city communities into the entertainment industry in animation and production, and in all of those kind of working class jobs that are also part of that industry. Out of conflict came collaboration. Out of conflict came collaboration. And the point I would try to make about this regional piece, and there's a few other stories that I want to just make sure that we get some time for questions, is that we often, when we hear about regional equity and inclusion and the harmony of the environment, and we hear about the harmony of the environment and the economy and equity together, we think, my gosh, this is great. We're all going to be happy. We won't have labor unions fighting any longer with us. It's all going to work out well. But in fact, there are conflicts, and those conflicts are part of our Stumbling to find the uncommon common ground. Learning to fight together with a way that also leads us to collaboration at the end. Rather than being collaboration happy in a way that eliminates the possibility of conflict and representing your own interest. Do you know the point I'm trying to make? So what about capacity? If it's all so good, uh, why isn't this uh, all happening? Well, I, I would say that in terms of lifting the regional equity agenda up, we certainly have entrenched interests that uh, are challenged by the question of uh, fairness. We certainly have a failure of vision, uh, but we also have a failure of capacity. I mean, I think that there's an assumption that because this regionalism holds the promise of being more equitable, that quite naturally, uh, community groups, low-income community groups, particularly community groups of color, are going to somehow just jump on this agenda. Once they find out that regionalism is good for them, right, they're going to do it. And I think you know these kinds of efforts. I'm sure they happen here, and I know they happen all over the country, where the sense is that, gosh, we're really excited about regionalism, and we're really excited about bringing people together at a regional level, so we're going to invite people to come, and then they don't show up. They must not be interested. But part of what's going on is that low-income communities of color, as they look at this issue of regionalism and how to tie into it, are also afraid that they might lose power in a broader alliance, that their own specific interests might get lost in the regional picture. They have their own internal conflicts about what strategies to pursue 
at a regional level. We've just been working again in the city of East Palo Alto, which has got a very sizable African American population and even more sizable Latino population. They're very different in terms of their age characteristics. One is much older African Americans than Latinos. And they have very different interests about how much development they want in the community than as a result, too. The older African American community wants a lot less development and sort of keeping out big box retail, et cetera. Latinos want more, hey, give me traffic, uh, give me jobs, et cetera. Those kind of internal conflicts play a role as well. So there's a lot of reasons why communities don't necessarily jump into this immediately. However, I'll be talking a lot more about this tomorrow at the Coalition for a Livable Future conference. And if you want to hear the rest of this part of the talk, which I'm sure is pretty much like going to be a golden moment for you if you come, um, come. But one of the things I think that it suggests, when I, I'll lift up more of the stuff about conflicts uh, tomorrow, is that organizations need to get their own bearings and decide on their own issues, and that requires a lot of patient work and patient investment. And one thing I would suggest to those of you uh, who know about this is that it's very important to make those kind of long-term investments in community organizations and in community leadership rather than saying, and I've seen this all over the country where people are saying, okay, now we're going to do like a regional vision, right? And let's invite the minority groups. And then, gosh, they don't show up. But we haven't done capacity and training about what does it mean to do planning? How do you get engaged? I mean, we did some of this in a couple of different locations where I've worked where before those kinds of meetings, we'll go out to the community groups and meet with them. And we actually, for example, uh, it's pretty easy. We used to, uh, uh, when we were engaging some community groups in one particular area, we used to go out and offer to take over the English as a second language class because that would really connect you with people. And we said, they would say, well, why do you want to do that? We go, well, planning is a second language anyway, right? Nobody understands that either, right? So we would bring people together through those mechanisms, educate them, outreach to them, help them prepare to go to a good meeting so that they could be very effective and engaged and articulate what their concerns were at these broader regional meetings. It's different than saying, oh, here's a big meeting. It's regional concerns. We're going to invite people. It's building the capacity to participate. And that takes uh, a long time. Okay, so for those of you who tuned out, what did we do today? We talked about collaboration. Uh, we talked about the fact that there's this interest in the new regionalism, and there's intersections between these different strands of regionalism around business and environment and social justice. And we also talked about why equity is central to each one of those, why there's a business interest in equity, why there's an environmental interest in equity, and certainly why the social justice groups have wanted to lift up this question. We've talked about conflict. We've talked about the fact that as you bring groups together, you should expect conflict. You know, many of the things that we treasure in this world right now, a cleaner environment, a civil rights movement, a union movement, were born out of conflict. And out of conflict came things that we now think of as being basic planks of who we are. This is likely to be an issue fraught with conflict. and. In particular, it's one that lifts up the kind of congealed or landscape of race and class in the United States. That is bound to be conflictual. We should expect it. We should understand it's going to happen. And capacity. In order to get m the most distressed neighborhoods and most distressed communities to participate effectively in this debate, we need to be doing long-term leadership development and investments in capacity building. That's three C's, collaboration, conflict, and capacity. But I think what's at stake, really, is a fourth C, citizenship. And by that, I don't mean legal citizenship. I don't mean whether or not in California you have the right to get a driver's license, a recent debate we've had. But I think, I mean more the civic participation and engagement. I want to suggest to you that although we see it around us every day, that people are actually tired of the corrosive politics that's occurring at a national level. They are tired of seeing people played off against one another. <laughs> they are tired of race being used as a weapon to divide. They are tired because, you know, of gay marriage being this, and I know you're in the middle of your own controversies about that, right? But everybody is tired of, you know, People want to have the debate, but people are tired of that being, being used as a way to divide people because we, now we know how many of us are gay and lesbian and how many of our friends and brothers and sisters are 
People are tired of the way that mayors can't get along. People are tired of the way that the California legislature just locks up and can't pass a budget. They are tired of the bickering and partisanship in Washington and the mockery that's been made of the way we're trying to investigate even the 9-11 controversies. They are tired of that. And they are looking for a different level at which to engage. And the different level at which to engage is this regional level. This regional movement is more than about good policy, although one hopes it will produce good policy. It's about trying to find a new level at which we can engage across communities when the national and state levels have become so hard to do that. There's a hunger out there, and it's a moral hunger, it's an emotional hunger, and it's a spiritual hunger. And as we lift these issues up of policy, we must remember that we're really what we're trying to bring forward is a new kind of conversation on a new kind of America, a new kind of search for an uncommon common ground. Thank you. Thank you. Rather than three C's, I think he gets all A's. Uh, we come now to the question and answer period of our program, and typically it is only City Club members who have the privilege of asking questions of our guests. But when we have a co-sponsor, as we do today, those of you who are here from the um, Coalition for a Livable Future are also welcome to ask questions. Our first question, however, will be asked by our guest board member, Guinevere Milius, who is um, identity management has an identity management company called Stevie and Milius and she is also a uh, director of the uh, Young Leaders, the New Leaders uh, group. And in addition to that, she and her partner helped design and spent a lot of time on pro bono work designing our web page. So we welcome Gwen Milius. And uh, after that, please line up. You'll see there's two microphones. Please feel free to line up even as Dr. Pastora is answering questions. Thanks. Dr. Pastor, uh, in Oregon, as in a lot of states, we're having an issue with taxes. And um, you know, we've, we as a region have been given a lot of credit for what we've been able to do uh, in order to make our, our region attractive to businesses and to the people that live here. But meanwhile, uh, most of the taxes that are collected in our state go to the state and then are funneled back out um, to our communities, in including our own. And as a result of this situation, we are constantly battling the rest of the state for tax dollars, for the programs that we'd like to see occur, um, for schools, for affordable housing, um, for all sorts of things that we'd like to be able to do and, and can't seem to pull together. And so my question is, is kind of two parts. One is, does the money matter? Um, do, do we realize that maybe we can't get folks to talk about taxes and raise taxes and do what we need to do to pay for the programs we want as a region and in a state? And if we can't, if the money does matter and we can't seem to raise it locally or as a state, is the federal government helping with these kinds of programs and initiatives? And if they're not, should they? I'm still stuck on identity management, actually. Uh, <laughs> it's a great uh, thing to be thinking about. It's very interesting uh, to ask a Californian about taxes. Uh, since we have one of the worst uh, and in most incoherent tax structures. But you're, you're asking a very uh, important uh, question. And I think that uh, there's, let me start with the last part that you asked about the federal government. One of the things that is going to be setting the terrain for almost all state governments uh, in the future is this uh, $500 billion deficits uh, for as far as the eye can see at the federal level. Uh, and what that means unless we fix the fiscal problem at the federal level is that the resources available to help states out will not be there and in fact states are probably likely to get more and more of the kind of social service burdens that um, we are that states are already complaining about California is a place that's certainly complaining about that because it is the recipient of a lot of immigrants the immigration is really a national phenomena and in fact, the benefits from immigration tend to be national because the taxes immigrants pay tend to go to the federal government and the costs that immigrants incur uh, tend to be at the local level. So we certainly know these issues very, very well. I think one of the things that is uh, 
good to be thinking about as we do this is how to get the tax structures back down more to a local level while including mechanisms for redistribution so that areas that don't have significant tax bases are able to get access to some taxes as well. There's a lot of talk about regional tax sharing and that sort of thing. Why is it important to get it down locally? I think it's important for it to be down locally because people are far more uh, trusting at the local level than they are at the state level. I mean, they really tend to think that if the taxes are going up there and being handed around, that they're not going to come back to their own communities. And so I think that issue of making sure that people see where the taxes are and where the services are is very important. Um, let me say one other thing, which you know I think uh, may or may not be uh, popular. Um, I uh, look at my life, and one of the things I realize is that I am such a beneficiary of so many things. Uh, you know, I had wonderful uh, parents, and my father came to this country in the 1930s and fought in World War II. And when he came back from the war, uh, he there was a GI Bill, and he was able to buy a house, and that was paid for uh, and subsidized. And he was able to go to a community college and get an education so that a guy with a sixth grade education could go from being a janitor to being a uh, air conditioner repairman, and that was paid for with some taxes. And I was able to go to decent public schools in the neighborhood where I lived, even though it was fairly low income, because people in California were paying some taxes. And I was able to go to the University of California. It was virtually free because people were paying some taxes, right? And now I'm like a full professor at that University of California, which I think is pretty cool and uh, not bad for the society either. And, you know, I even get invited to come up to speak to the city club and stuff. So that's pretty cool. And that's because some people were paying some taxes. And when I look and I see my tax bill come in and my vehicle license fee got cut back in the state of California, it doesn't really make much sense to me. And uh, I'm getting a gigantic income tax break this year because of what's happened at the federal level, and that doesn't make much sense to me. And in the community where I live, they're shutting down the most low-income and immigrant uh, school because they don't have enough funding, and they're not taxing me. It just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> we stand on other people's shoulders. We stand on the investments that people made in a public infrastructure. And if we don't continue to make those investments, we will not be standing as a society. And this, you know, I think part of the thing that drives low taxes is a distrust of the government, and that's an important sentiment to be paying attention to. That's why we need to get these kind of mechanisms that tie people to understanding what the benefits are. But just go back and think of your own life and think about what would happen if you didn't really have the public infrastructure that taxes paid for. Yeah. Chris Smith, City Club member and member of Coalition for a Livable Future. Uh, I've had the opportunity this last year to, to sit in on a seminar at Portland State University on regional economic development. And one of the interesting issues we've looked at is in, uh, in job creation at a regional level, um, you know, there are strategies that will create a lot of jobs, uh, but they may be relatively low paying jobs in the service sector. And sort of the, the trade off between the total number of jobs versus uh, the quality of jobs and what that means for, for the prosperity of the region as measured in terms of uh, average per capita income as opposed to just you know, the number of people employed. Uh, do you have any thoughts about um, sort of what are the right goals to pursue in that kind of a, a, a question? You know, I, uh, again, come from uh, California, and one thing uh, that I often talk about is the, you know, California pretty much thinks of itself as the heart of the new economy, and in many ways it is with high technology and other aspects. If you look at the official state figures for the uh, jobs of the future in California, what do you think are among the top 10 jobs in the state of California in terms of the new occupations for the future? Health services, I heard. What else? Beauticians. Uh, yeah, probably, actually, we, we need that there. Uh, <laughs> you heard retail. Here, uh -huh. Anything else come up to you? Under, that's, uh, he said undertakers, I think that's wishful thinking by an Oregorian <laughs> uh, wanting to, uh, yeah. Plastic surgery. Plastic surgery. <laughs> this is an amusing audience. Uh, <laughs> well, we often hear like information technology, the number f uh, one job in terms of new jobs uh, in the state of California in the next 10 years uh, is uh, re retail sales clerk, then after that cashiers, 
uh, who run the machines that the retail sales clerks sell for, right? Then after that, it's food service workers. And then after that, it's waiters and waitresses, which are different than those. You go down the list, it's not until you get to about number uh, eight that you come across a registered nurse. The number nine fastest growing job in the state of California is actually executives. It's kind of interesting. That, that used to be the number one fastest growing job, but then uh, the uh, kind of crash of the dot-com economy slowed that down. And the number 10 fastest growing job in the state of California uh, is security guards who are protecting all the stuff the executives have from frustrated retail sales clerks. <laughs> we have to be honest about this new economy. This new economy is generating jobs at the top end, but it's also generating a lot of jobs at the bottom end. Behind every software engineer is an army of nannies and retail sales clerks and food service workers, and they are also part of that new economy. And the way to put this together is to have a business-oriented strategy about creating high-end jobs and keeping those high-end businesses going, but also have a set of labor protections that involve the bottom of the labor market. And a lot of those things are living wage laws. A lot of those things are getting access to health insurance and ways that seem to be affordable for people. Doing the kind of work that really fully recognizes that the full part of a new economy is both this high end and this low end. We have to be honest about that. When we think about regional economic development, we always think about these sort of shimmering jobs at the top end, but that's only one part of the regional economic picture. Yes, you're, you're next. Hi, Shava Nirad, New City Club member. Um, I'm executive director of a group called National Civitas, and we create uh, curricula for civics, leadership development, grassroots organizing courses. We teach primarily to the grassroots, and I was really interested to hear you talk about that as being capacity building, because I think that's a really good way to describe it. Um, what do you think about going to grassroots communities and minority communities and such and presenting these things to them as leadership development? Because my experience is that if you say the word leadership development, in many of these communities, people say, I'm not, I'm not a leader, I just want to get things done. Uh, thank you. W we actually just went through a really interesting uh, experience over the last two years, uh, which I will talk about uh, tomorrow, in which we worked with uh, three community-based organizations in uh, three different low-income neighborhoods in the Bay Area, in West Oakland, in East Palo Alto, and then in the Mayfair neighborhood in East San Jose, which is the neighborhood where Cesar Chavez did his first organizing as an urban organizer before he went to the fields. And what we tried to do was to help people connect up to the regional dynamics that were affecting their lives. And what we learned uh, from that was that it, you, you have to be very slow, you have to be very patient, you have to think about, as you're saying, leadership development, uh, and you have to do two things I'd highlight right now that might be a little different that you haven't heard. You can't talk down. You can't talk down. I had a really interesting experience where I went and spoke to a series of workforce development professionals, and then the next day I went and gave the same talk at the Mayfair neighborhood uh, with mostly people who had English as a second language, et cetera, and everybody got it. They knew what was going on. They could resonate with the facts and the statistics, and they could determine the strategies as well. So one really important thing is to not talk down, because we often do that with these communities, right? We think, oh, we're going to build their capacity, those poor people, right? We're delivering new tools and new strategies that maybe people haven't heard or haven't been brought to them. The second thing that we really learned in doing this is that no matter what we did, they wound up learning a lot more from each other. So the biggest thing that we did was we said, as we were struggling to get this going, you know what? We got a bunch of people who were leaders in these three different communities, and we put them on an airplane, and we flew them down to Los Angeles. And we spent a day with Agenda, the group I talked about, and a group called the Figueroa Corridor Coalition, which has landed the biggest community benefits agreement that's been signed uh, in the United States thus far. And then we took them up to the mission. And we looked at, which is in San Francisco, and we looked at groups that were working with undocumented workers. I mean, peer-to-peer -peer learning is a really important part of it. So putting people into that conversation as a way of building capacity, rather than thinking that somehow the academics can just deliver the capacity to folks. Uh, it has to be done with humility. We have time for one more very short question. Thank you. Don McGilvery, and I'm affiliated with the Coalition for Livable Future through Southeast Uplift and the Buckman Community Association. Um, recently, Ralph Nader made the statement that one third of the jobs in the United States earn less than $10 per hour. And so, again, what 
basically those aren't living wage jobs. And given the competition that we have internationally for, for jobs, uh, you know, what is, what is, you know, well, anyhow, just, just talk about those, those issues. Well, I think she wants a short answer, too. That would require a long one, so we'll do it afterwards, too. But let me just say a quick word about that, which is that um, progressives focus a lot on that bottom end and those jobs that pay less than $10 an hour. But part of what keeps those jobs going is making sure that you have rooted industries that pay a lot more, that generate the s local serving demand for the kinds, those kind of jobs and help keeps the wages up, too. I think it's really critical to try to couple a business strategy, a development strategy, a regional economic strategy with a labor standard strategy, which lifts up the bottom, but also recognizes the rootedness of the industries. It's interesting that DreamWorks paid a lot, I mean, sorry, that Agenda paid a lot of attention to this high-end animation and studio industry, and then is using that to also steer into community benefits agreements which bring up the bottom end of the labor market. We need to be doing both things at the same time. And clearly the other issue that's out there is the whole question of outsourcing uh, to the rest of the world as well. And I did want to announce, I should have said this at the beginning, that this is probably going to be my last talk in the uh, Great Northwest because as far as I understand it, the whole issue of keynote speakers is now being outsourced <laughs> and uh, you'll be able to be calling these in from foreign countries. So thank you for this. <laughs> Goodbye. Excellent presentation, and I think that uh, we might all be well served if we attend the summit tomorrow. So there is information on that in the lobby. Thank you very much, Dr. Pastor. We are adjourned. <laughs>